can give you 10 others, how Shu Xin that you know from how for him, you know Shu Xin? The uh, Judaic scholar in, in, in okay, no, I, I, I prefer no, okay. you to speak. Okay, we have uh, three more questions. I suggest we take them together mm -hmm. as a group. Uh, first, it's uh, Yusef Hakimi, and then Shalom Friedman, and uh, Professor Rafi Israel. There's another Shalom Friedman? Uh, <laughs> there's two more. Okay. Uh, so, Yusef, please. Okay. I first went to China in 1974. I was invited part of a trade delegation. George Bush's father was the ambassador. I remember that our, uh, and by the way, the streets in those days were Which full of Bush. The President of the United States father, first George Bush, first. Uh -huh. he was ambassador to China. George H. And then uh, we, uh, the streets were full of red guards, and I remember that. Our Chinese guide, by the way, there was always two, I was just one, but there were two guides. I would swear to this day that the job was for one of them to watch the other. We were in Shanghai, and he shows us a building, and he says, this building belonged to the Jewish nation. And then, of course, I was very politely quiet, and then I asked him afterward, what are you talking about, Jewish nation? And then, apparently, the building belonged to the Sassoon family, which were the Iraqi Jews who had later on gone to India, and from there they went to, uh, they went to China. I basically like to see the picture your way. And I have been to China many times, by the way. I like to see it your way. But I wonder, and I'm raising this as your question, uh, I wonder if this is not an admiration that you feel among many anti-Semites <coughs> who say, who see Jews controlling everything, knowing, uh, basically a small group, but nevertheless, controlling the destiny of the world. And now I would say this, and this I'd like to uh, have your response to this. If they see it that way, in so far as Israel is concerned, not only God knows, but all of us around here know that Israel needs help diplomatically and in other countries around the world. Why not go after it? Why not? Why not go after it? Why not, why not build a friendship? So you agree with me? Can I give you a few questions? Okay. Uh, instead of Professor Israel, you have to leave. So instead of Professor Israel, we have a question by uh, David Weizmann. So Sharon Friedman first, and then David. Um, everybody agrees with the position that uh, Israel and Jewish people should try and strengthen the ties with China. But the position you present with China and here I agree with Izzy Lieber, is so unrealistic. It's so unrelated to the reality on the ground. What is China doing today? What is China doing in Iran? What is China's <coughs> technical advisors in Iran? The large natural gas deal. Throughout the Arab world, China is strongly allied with all the powers which are against Israel. The problem, as I understand it, in talking and trying to push in the direction of a Chinese alliance, the United States, Israel at the present moment has one real ally in the world, very questionable ally, the United States. There is now a global struggle emerging and going on between China and the United States. China in every way, I agree with you here too, China has acts not, not simply with the Jews, with every work area in the world. They learn and they move forward. They progress on all fronts. They're moving ahead. They want to dominate. Dominate not simply Southeast Asia or Asia, but it seems to me to become the middle kingdom once again. Okay, that's a, that's a question which you can put aside and argue about. But in relation to Israel, in relation to Jewish people, talk about what we can give them and what they can get from us. They've gotten certain things from us. They've got military things from us, military technology which they can use. They'll get wherever they can, whatever they can. What can we, what can they give us? Will they give us support against Ahmadinejad in the United Nations? Will they? Will they do anything? Okay, well, let me finish. And uh, emotionally, I'm, I'm, uh, I just, I just wish that there was some realistic relation to our position, to our actual position. Israel is struggling for its life now on many different fronts. China is a player which 
moves against Israel much more than it moves in any all this sympathy and this wonderful thing about Jewish studies departments and people who are historians and they're wonderful and they want to understand it. Okay. Thank you. That's that's my question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wald, for for uh, your expose. It was actually extremely interesting. Uh, as a journalist, I have two questions. In fact, one question and one proposal. Uh, do you intend uh, to translate your book into Chinese? First of all, and second, uh, just uh, launched a, a TV channel six months ago, and uh, I would be very honored to invite you so that uh, we could help you with the promotion of your book. Uh, I someone took my book, so I don't I didn't answer your second question. Which my, one is your book? Sorry, which uh, one is your book? This one. Uh, <laughs> uh, first question, then let's go to Iran. Uh, the first question was my book in China. It has been translated into Chinese by the University of Henan. The Chinese censorship has not allowed its publication in China. It could be published in Hong Kong, but then it would not be openly sold in China. The reason being that my chapter on the growing tension between China and Islam is did not pass the censorship, because that's a very delicate issue. Also, I made a comment about censorship in China, which the censors want out. The censor doesn't want to be called the censor. Uh, so they, the translators are negotiating with the censorship. It will come out somehow mutilated, not too much, uh, but uh, um, I would want the Jews to read the book. Your second question is what? No, yeah. the, this is not a question, actually, uh, I, I, it's an offer. I'm a sure. journalist and I would like to invite you. I ex ex a journalist in Israel. Israel I'm, a journalist. I'm an Israeli journalist. Beautiful, okay, except okay. And I, we I'm staying in Israel for uh, three or four more weeks. That, that's so I give I you my, my cell phone number. Okay, okay that's what I've heard. Actually, we do broadcast our TV channel in Europe and Asia. And that mm -hmm. was a, uh, mm -hmm. actually, okay. uh, Okay. Uh, uh, let's say Can we talk uh, just sure, after, sure, sure, after sure, everyone sure, has sure, left? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, I, I, I can't offer you a cake, they will be eating here. So, uh, <laughs> um, so can we come back to human rights? And uh, did I reply to the human rights concern? About the United States? Yeah, um, yeah why I understand what you're saying. China? Why go, for, why go mm -hmm. after China when so many other crimes are omitted? Why this? Uh, because, look, uh, of course, China and, and uh, America are in a global struggle, and we'll talk about this in a moment. Uh, it re when American rabbis now uh, attack China, you know what it reminds me? In World War I, all German rabbis were praying for the destruction of France and the, the, the victory of Kaiser Wilhelm II, and all French rabbis were praying for the destruction of Germany and the victory of the French, uh, the French mm -hmm. nation. It's sad, but you know, when I he hear American rabbis uh, ramping against China, it reminds me a little bit of this. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of this. The you, politics you, is, is, is a drug. Yeah, it's just bad. But then be, be pursue human rights. I see these American Jews using the human yeah, rights yeah, because on and off exactly yeah. like State Department. Human rights are very important in the United States. They are an instrument, and you turn it on and off according to whether the country you want to go after is a friend or an enemy. Uh, you, don't, you don't find the same human rights concerns about Saudi Arabia or about Pakistan that you have about uh, China. And their human rights uh, attitudes are not much different. So can you talk about Iran? Uh, I don't have all the, the necessary figures. I know a few things that are public or not public. Uh, China has been extremely cautious in its relations with Iran, in its military relations. It has reduced its military relations with Iran very considerably. You can have the details from the one Israeli expert who is allowed to speak about this, it's Yitzhak Shikor. Uh, 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 Haifa University has written about this. He can give you some figures. Uh, last year, Chinese uh, sales to Iran, military sales, have come down very considerably. They consist of short time, of short term uh, missiles, which is a Chinese tit for tat for America selling more effective missiles to Taiwan. The Chinese react to, uh, to the Taiwan, uh, America Taiwan relationship. Or, 
looks exciting. Watch one goes to the other. Do you know that China sold the yellow cake, which is used in the process of uh, refining uranium? They sold the principal amount to Iran. I have not heard of that. If that is true, then that's very great. Where do you have this information? Um, the exact source I can't give you at the moment, but I, I, I have that. Um, that there's a lot of false information on Chinese Iranian military relations that are coming my way. A lot of false information from American right wing think tanks, from Taiwanese sources who want to spoil Israeli relations with China. There's a lot of false information. Uh, I know that the use by Hezbollah of a Chinese, originally Chinese made missile against an Israeli patrol boat created enormous anger in China, created a clash between uh, China and Iran. And that could be one of the reasons why they have now come, because Iran had promised not to do that, not to give that reason to other countries. What does this have to do? Uh, China considers the American weapon sales to Taiwan as a provocation, and they want to tell the Americans, we can, sell, uh, we can, sell, we can also sell weapons to a country that you don't like. That is the tip for that. Uh, on Iran, on 15th of December 2005, Xinhua, Xinhua agency published a communique, which I have it in, in writing, I got it from, uh, from Xinhua. Uh, the Chinese foreign minister was asked what China, what, what was China's reaction to the Iranian president's denial of the Holocaust and his, his uh, threats against Israel's existence. The Chinese minister's reaction was the following. China uh, disagrees with any words or acts that create instability in the Middle East. The national rights of the state of Israel must be protected and preserved like the national rights of any other member of the United Nations. China has made it clear in its vote in the United Nations that it, uh, that it uh, is commemorates the horror of the Holocaust and does not agree with denial of the Holocaust. It was a clear, blunt statement uh, without ever mentioning Iran. That blunt statement, I have it in paper, in written, in writing, not a single Jewish newspaper, not a single mm -hmm. Jewish radio ever mentioned it. And that is, it, it was puzzling to me. I know that the American Jewish leadership thanked the Chinese government. Uh, uh, Malcolm Hernland told me he sent a personal note of thanks to the Chinese ambassador. They have seen it. Not a single, I mean, if you speak of prejudice and bias, there you have a bias. I am sure if the princess of Luxembourg would have made a statement about Iran, it would have made headlines, or the, the king of God knows. Uh, you have a king in the Netherlands, a queen in the Netherlands, it would have made headlines. China, who cares about China? Now, China has taken a very clear position on Iran, has told the Iranians that China has reduced its investment in, um, in uh, Iran until the day after those 16 American uh, uh, intelligence agencies made their statement. China has uh, uh, had um, uh, a major investment project with Iran, was not is what had been negotiated for years, $3 billion or more, uh, followed American warnings, did not, uh, did not sign it, told the Iranians, we are not going to sign this until you come clean on your nuclear developments. And uh, in December, 24 hours after the US uh, intelligence agencies made that infamous statement, uh, saying that Iran is no longer developing a nuclear bomb, they signed. Now, when the Chinese do something, uh, the, the way the Chinese do things is significant. Uh, normally, diplomatically, they should have waited two or three weeks. They signed the day after. That means they told the Americans, you are a bunch of schmucks. We have now, we have accepted to put our own economic interests lower than your interests, but you are not serious. Don't come back to us. Uh, if you want to run, rant against the United States security agencies, uh, you know. No, no, I, no, I understand. I was that told China and, and Iran have huge natural yeah. gas deals, yes. in which are a huge amount of billions of dollars of investment. And China is now one of the major investors in the whole development of Iranian energy systems. I mean, that's so you have to, I don't know. I don't know whether the figures are right.
uh, everyone else has. I'm told that the investments of the German and the French industry are as big as that of, of China. Three wrongs don't make the right, but in any case... Uh, no, no, three wrongs don't make a right, but you, you keep telling me that China is much worse than anyone else with regard to Israel. I don't see We're them talking about worse. China's relation to yeah. Israel and China's relation to the Jewish people, not Germany's relation or France. Uh, not worse. There's no comparison. The question of what is between the two of them. Look, uh, on this assessment there, uh, Shalom is absolutely right. This assessment of this 2016 idiotic agencies for political reasons came out with this assessment. Uh, also General Farkas and General Amidor both agree that that was a clear message from China that they signed this deal which they had held off the day after. I mean, this administration is dead. I mean, America has lost whatever respect the trade attack in Beijing. They will not, the Chinese now will not take the Americans seriously on anything regarding the Middle East. It's actually much worse. The, the, the insinuation is that these 16 agencies, uh, you know, when 16 say the same thing, you have a conspiracy. Uh, in, the, in the Gemara, when 70 judges condemn a man to death, uh, the man is released immediately. Because 70 people cannot be of the same opinion. So, uh, the Chinese belief is that the 16 did it at the secret, at the secret wink by Bush. That the American government has decided that they will not go to war, that Iran will have to bomb to that, but they needed to be, uh, to find a way out. So well, I they don't want to hold up everybody now. I just want to ask one question. What is China's interest in promoting relations, any kind of relations, military, in any way with Israel? How can how can the government of Israel work? How can the Jewish people work to further the interests of China in a way that they okay, can I'll, I'll tell you what the, how the Chinese view the world. I'll give you an example of all this thing. In the, nine, in the 18th century, there was uh, an, Italian, uh, an Italian painter called Castiglione, who went to China, became a famous painter. There's a, a fake, great painting of his where he shows the Emperor Chen Long, one of the great emperors of China, sitting on his throne, and two or three Kazakh tribesmen uh, bringing him horses, bringing him fine horses, and these three Kazakh horsemen are on their knees with their head on the ground to greet the emperor as their sovereign. Now, what does that painting mean? China needed these horses. China's expansion into Central Asia depended on Chinese cavalry. Uh, China is not a horse breeding country. They don't know how to do it. And China doesn't have the la very large green uh, uh, lawns to breed horses. They depended. They depended on these Muslim breeding horses for them. But they saw the horses they bought as a sign of the submission of these Muslims to China. China does not want to be seen as dependent. China doesn't want to be seen as dependent on Islam and the Muslims. Absolutely not. China wants to be seen as sovereign, and this is the reason why, from the moment the Chinese discovered their dependence on Muslim oil, which was about five years ago, three years, four years ago, they started slowly to re-establish and build up their relations with Israel. Again. It's very interesting. Chinese relations with Israel were miserable after Jiang Zemin's uh, uh, receiving a slap, the, 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 the uh, Falcon affair. Uh, was a horrible story for, for Israel. Uh, we had no choice. I say we, I feel solidarity. Israel had no choice because America threatened Israel in quite brutal ways. Israel had to break that contract, but it was a, a break of an international contract which harmed China. China had to reorganize its military planning. It, it, it needed these planes. And not to attack Taiwan, but because China's uh, command and control um, technologies are deficient. China has a huge territory to uh, maintain command and control over that territory. They need that sort of plane. And Israel gave them that plane and was forced to, uh, to abandon that plane. From then on, uh, Chinese relations with Israel plummeted very deep. And uh, they became better from 2003 on, when Katsaf was invited to visit China. Then all they are slowly getting better. The more Chinese depends on Arab oil, the more they want to show the Muslims mm -hmm. we don't depend on you. We are Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, final, yeah, I just want to make, thanking you 
I want to make one remark because something which in our recent conversations came up many times. Uh, you simply don't say it here, which is totally other issue. We have this image of Tibet being a, a greatly moral a humanitarian country, whereas what you claim is that uh, the Tibetans in these recent riots uh, murdered massively Chinese civilians. You are 30 or 40. Well, and I, I think if the Arabs would, would burn alive 30 or 40 Jews in the old city, the Israeli police would react very quickly. And they could easily kill 100 uh, Plus the fact that uh, Tibet has, Tibet has a, uh, a fairly cruel history itself. A yes. very cruel history, of course. And, and I think uh, people some don't reason know or the other, I mean... Uh, no, because the Dalai Lama's propaganda was very, very No, oh, I mean, uh, and, and that view is shared by an expert on, on Chinese Muslims like Professor Sukhoi, who also says that, that uh, that the Tibetans uh, have managed via the, the Dalai Lama to build up some kind of a facade of beha behind which there isn't uh, I, very I've much. Nothing, I mean, I like the Tibetans. I was in Tibet. It's, it's a very interesting culture. It's, it's an enticing, it, it is the most interesting Abu Dazara culture that I know. <laughs> well, that's what it is, you know. It, we cannot, I mean, for these American rabbis to feel sympathy for Tibetan religion, it's ridiculous. Uh, but anyway, it's very interesting. It, 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 it is an extremely interesting history. That history was always closely connected to China. There was a time in the 8th century where the Tibetans were stronger. They occupied half of China. Uh, they made war on China, conquered half of it, and there was, there was, there was a larger country. And that's why you have very large Chinese, uh, Tibetan communities all over China still. Uh, of course, Tibet was under Chinese sovereignty for hundreds of years. When the Tibetans tell you that they were independent, they mix up two terms. They, their xenophobic isolation, they call independence. They try to isolate themselves, and very few people went there. But uh, of course, they were, they were warriors. They did war. The relationship between the beauty of uh, Buddhist teaching and the reality of Tibetan history is like the relationship between Jesus and the and European history. Mm -hmm. uh, these monks can be, um, they are very friendly people, when, you know, I visited these monasteries, but they can be very violent also. They had wars between themselves. You had wars between the, the two, the, the monk orders, the Galukpa and the Kalmapa. By the way, the idea of the, uh, the, the, the Dalai Lama function was invented by the Chinese. The Chinese emperor um, invented the, the uh, the uh, Dalai Lama function in the 15th century. There was no Dalai Lama before. The whole thing is very complicated, and I, I don't want to defend everything the Chinese did. I'm sure the Chinese police was very brutal. They are brutal against the Chinese too. Um, but uh, this idealization of the Tibetans, uh, as I told you, what you happened, what you had in Tibet was a race riot. It was a race riot of the of the kind of the South African or or, uh, or uh, Kenyan sort with uh, Tibetans angry at the uh, Chinese immigrants who opened shops and uh, made them competition, so they attacked the shops, which the Dalai Lama immediately presented as a, as a national liberation struggle. And the Jews fell for that, of course. So, uh, Not the Jews. The Jews. Oh, uh, uh, I speak of those famous yeah. 120, 180 rabbis. Rabbi, 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 Rabbi. You know the whole list. I would like to say thank you very much for very informative presentation. Our next event is going to be next Wednesday, June 4th, uh, lecture by uh, Judge Bach, the Reflections of the Act on the Act on China. So if you haven't registered and you'd like to come, please let me know. Anyone wants any of these books, or are you, have you so, been so fed up with, uh, with my speech that you don't want to hear about this anymore?